so sorry. Next time, call me. Yes. Sometimes he changes. Yeah, because remember he wanted to destroy Israel and and Moses said then blot out my my name too. Yeah. 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 Amen. I wish I'd seen your hand. Next time. Next next time, okay? Yes. <laughs> okay. But I will pay attention to that. I just want to tell you the Sabbath, good, good to see you next week. How you doing, sir? Okay. Happy Sabbath. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Hey, how you doing? Eva.
Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning. Good morning. I am inviting you to please grab your church hymnal and we're going to praise God with our singing today. And uh, the first song is uh, 457. Turn to hymn number 457. I love to tell the story.
Please turn to hymn number 327, I'd Rather Have Jesus. Hymn number 327. Silver or gold. 
Our Father, which art in heaven, we come to you this morning and we want to thank you, first of all, for the Sabbath. It's good to be able to come apart and, and be here and to spend some time with you. Father, I, I want to thank you for life, for what you're doing, for your master plan for this world, and for the master plan you have for each one of us. And Lord, we just want to commit ourselves to you today. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Be with this service in a very special way. Be with the pastor as he gives us the message, and be with each participant, and be with each one of us in the pews. Father, we are yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy to have you with us here this Sabbath. It's a beautiful day, isn't it? Yes. You know, we're privileged to live here in California, especially in this part of the country. Uh, we, uh, when I first started my ministry, we started back east in Pennsylvania, 
And I want to tell you something. This weather is fantastic compared to what we had back there. <laughs> but uh, it's just a blessing to be here today. Uh, we have some announcements we have to have made here. And uh, so I want to, first of all, if uh, you, you want to come and give yours first of all here? Artie is going to tell us a little bit about what's going on here. Yeah, Pastor, you were there last year when we had our uh, uh, effort at the San Diego County Fair in Del Mar Fairgrounds. Yeah. And it's a great experience to be there. It is. You know, I didn't know what it was going to be like, but uh, actually last year was the third year that we went. And uh, we just really enjoy it. You meet a lot of neat people. And the fellowship is just fantastic. And it's just a wholesome experience. So uh, I understand we get in free, don't we? On, uh... Yes, and uh, the Del Mar Fair would start this coming Sabbath. It's going to be from June 7 through uh, July 6. It's every day but Mondays and the first two Tuesdays. Now, there are four areas where you could help as a volunteer. One was, just like you mentioned, being a greeter. Yeah. That's a lot of people to meet there, right, Pastor? It is, yeah. And the second one is uh, taking blood pressure. The blood pressure device is very simple. It's nothing complicated. It's an electronic device. And uh, you could do it if you commit your time. And the third station is the uh, Carada scan, in which we screen uh, those participants for their uh, metabolic index, for their body fat. We tell them their body age and even their metabolic rate. And then the fourth station, as a volunteer, if you're familiar with the uh, New Start health principles that we are advocating as a church, that will be the last station. What was the station that you were involved with, Pastor, the last year? That you Mostly were I did the greeting. Wow. So I enjoyed that. You know, That's pretty easy, right? Boy. That's why I enjoyed it. Amen. So in your bulletin, there is enjoyment and excitement in serving the Lord. Amen? Yes. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Grab that blue sheet. Fill it up with your availability, your name, telephone number, email address where we could get hold of you, and we will. We'd like you to participate. If you could place this in the offering plate, or I'm going to be at the back of the church when you exit this morning after our service, and I would love to talk to you and tell you more about this health booth we have at the fair. At the same time, work with your availabilities. I just want to say one last word on this. I am really believe in this. I think that's great what we are doing there. And I didn't see any other religious group doing anything like we were doing. And it's interesting, the people that came through, and uh, uh, when they walked away, they had a good impression of Seventh-day Adventist. And I thought that's, a, that's what it's all about. Right. Not only that, the ability to share yeah. our books and materials on what we believe. And at the end time, some people will come to us and say, Hey, thank you so much. That book that you have given me at the fair... That was the beginning. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you. Do you suppose I could say a word on this too? Yes, yeah. Pastor. This, this past Wednesday, the Ministerial Association for South County voted to uh, give us some funds. So I just want to encourage you. you know, there is some expense involved in this, and they voted to uh, give $500 Amen. towards this cause for literature and, and space rent and all that. Amen. The tickets for the volunteers are free. So please contact us and uh, we'll make sure that uh, you're scheduled based upon your availabilities. Thank you so much. Now we'd like to have the uh, social service committee, if they'd like to come up here and just share with us some things. Thank you. Oops. I, I maybe I can stand up here too. I think you should. <laughs> Um, just want to add to the fair. The fair is just a wonderful experience. Um, and there's going to be something even better coming next year related to the fair, so stay tuned. But my announcement is primarily for the ladies. Because what's the big event happening in June? Father's Day. And so we have some good ideas already, but we'd like a few more. So if any of you ladies would like to come tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock to the boardroom, we'd like to make the Sabbath potluck on June 14 the best these guys have ever had. I'll be there. Okay.
<laughs> you know, I'm new at this, so I, uh, they tell me we have the scripture now, and so if you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to the scripture. John chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. The next day, there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus' and disciples were also there, invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festival, so Jesus' mother told him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus said, replied. My time has not yet come. But Jesus told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Our hymn of praise is hymn number 371. Lift him up, 371.
Amen. 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 Now I invite you to kneel with me as we seek the Lord in prayer. Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Remember your words that you've given to us, Father, that says, this is the day which the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we start off by saying thank you for your mighty hand, which was capable and able to bring each of us through another week. And Father, now as we worship you this morning, we bring you the essence of all and who we are, not pretending to be someone else, but knowing full well that we are all sinners in your sight. And we ask that you would continue to forgive us, Father. Thank you for making us new men and women, new boys and girls children of the Most High God. And Father, give us your spirit that we can live in such a way that we'll let others know that we truly are your children. And Father, this morning there are several of your children who are hurting today or continue to need your healing power. And we bring you Judy Rogers, Father, that we know that some days are good days and we know that some days are a struggle. But, Father, let your presence be made known to her and that she would remember the promises in your words that said that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And, Father, remember all those who need your healing power today, those who are discouraged and and need a word from your prophet, Lord. Let them hear that word today as well. Remember our men and women who are serving overseas and And those who are remembering, it's your holy Sabbath. That, Lord, you will not let them have duty today, but let them have a time where they can rest. Father, remember this church in a special way and the events that are upcoming like Del Mar Fair. And prepare the way, Father. Touch the hearts of those who are planning to go. Touch the hearts of those who are planning to serve. And, Father, bless those in a special way who organize and and, and make decisions, that they would make decisions based solely upon your will. And Father, finally, when everything is done and said today, may all the glory, all the praise, shed light and truly ring forth the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Savior for mankind. So Father, we thank you in Jesus' holy name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our oh, Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Amen. It's time for a children's story. So if I could have all the little boys and girls come up front. And Uncle Mike will be given the story today. And Mike, here's the mic for you. I see a lot of hands up in the back on the this side. One more, there's a hand in the back. Okay, good job, good job. There's a hand over here. Okay. And I think that's it. So if you can come back. Good job. Thank you, boys and girls. Okay, go ahead and sit down for the story. Hi, guys. Okay. First thing I want everybody to do is close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. Close them tight. Okay, now think about somebody you really love. Okay? Open your eyes. Who did you think about? Jesus. Wonderful. Jesus wants you to love him. Who did you think about? God and Jesus. Right. How about you? Uh, my parents and God. Your parents and God. Wonderful. God loves you to want to love your parents. How about you? Um, Jesus loves me. Does love you. How about you? Who did you think about? My grandpa Jesus loves me. Your grandpa and Jesus. Wonderful. I'm going to share a story with you guys that, that shows that Jesus really wants you to love everybody. Everyone. So he wants you to love each other. He wants you to love absolutely everybody the way he loves everybody. This is a story of a man that was walking down the road. He was just walking down the road minding his own business. And then some bad guys came bad guys. They came and beat this man up. They wanted his stuff. So they beat him up. They put a bunch of owies all over his body. You know what an owie is? They put a bunch of owies all over him. It's, um, a, it's where um, uh, someone is either bruised or hurt and it takes time for it to heal up. Okay, that's an owie. For those of you who didn't know. So they left this man on the side of the road with a bunch of owies. And then a little while later, a man came walking by. This man came walking by, and he looked at this man laying on the side of the road. But guess what? He just kept walking. He just kept walking. So he walked away. The man is still laying there on the side of the road. And then a little while later, another man came walking by. And he walks by next to this guy who sees him. He sees him on the side of the road. But guess what? He didn't help either. He just kept walking by. So this poor man is still laying on the side of the road. And then, a while later, a Samaritan man came walking by. Looked down and seen him, this man laying on the side of the road. But this time, he didn't walk away. What do you think he did? Okay. He helped him up. Exactly. He felt sorry for the guy. So he helped him up. And not only did he help him up, but he actually helped him get on his donkey. And then they rode into town together so that the man could care for him. So you see, the story is that 
we can help anybody. We might not be able to help everybody, but we can help anybody. So if you see somebody in the playground at school, or maybe when you're playing outside in your neighborhood at home, and they need some help, what do you think we ought to do? We got to help them. Got to help them? What if you see someone getting bullied at school? What do you think we ought to do? Tell someone. Who's some of the people we can tell? The teacher. Okay. The teacher. How about our parents? Can we tell our parents? Of course we can. So this week, I want you guys to go and show God's love and be a good Samaritan. Okay? You want to release us in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day they have given us, and please make sure that everyone is safe as we go. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. What a wonderful prayer. You can go back to your seats. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, boys and girls. Our worshiping given today is going to go towards evangelism. And I just want to say that many years ago, I should throw a few many is in there. Many, many years ago, when my brother and I, uh, we were considering joining the church, I remember we came back from visiting my grandparents And um, we wanted to be a part of this organization. And uh, evangelism takes on a lot of different faces. It takes on a lot of different hats. And um, I remember one of the elders came to our home and and gave us Bible studies. And and faithfully came every Friday night. You know, when we think of evangelism, there's so much to do. And all of us should be a part of that. Amen? Amen. We, were, we all remember uh, the marching orders that Jesus gave us in the book of Matthew, in Matthew 28. It says, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always even to the end of the world. Deacons, if you can please stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift, the talent that each of us may have. Not only that we would recognize it, but Father, that we would use it to your glory and to your honor. And through this end we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Yeah, I guess I uh, just want to thank the Homan family, if I say that right, Adi and Henny, for coming. We met them in the uh, Chinese Fellowship several years back when we used to attend a Bible study with our nephew, Mihai. I don't know if any of you knew, the, knew him. It was, they had a the Bible study fellowship close to our home, and we met and got familiar with them. And their sons, Jonathan and Dylan, are going to bless us with special music, so we're just thankful for that. My goodness, that was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was nice. Well, let's pray before we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we humbly ask that as we open the pages of sacred scripture, that the one who inspired it would come here and be our teacher, be our inspiration. May we see Jesus, Lord, in new ways. May we love him more for being here and spending this time together, we pray in his name. Amen. I want to tell you that uh, part of the sermon for this morning is, uh, was inspired by going to the Ahana group this last Wednesday night. I told them, I warned them ahead of time that they were going to have to hear it twice. Let me get my cordless mic on here. In other words, this is a little advertisement for Ohana groups. What are Ohana groups? They're home Bible study fellowships that uh, Pastor Maxwell and his wife are introducing to our church. And we had just a fantastic time last Wednesday night. The, the spirit was there with the sharing and the singing and all we do. So thank you, Pastor Maxwell, and please pass on to, to your dear wife, Pat, uh, our thankfulness for your leadership in this area. 
So, this is the season of what? June. Father's Day. But what else? Graduations. What else? Spring break. No, not spring break. Summer break. Okay. What else? Weddings. That's right. This is a season of weddings. Begins with July. June. Well, anyway, people get married all times of the year now. But uh, anyway, June is known for weddings. On a Ju you ever a June bride? I don't know. Anyway. My daughter's getting married in July. She's a July bride. Oh, man. How can this be? My baby's getting married. Anyway, it's happening, honey. And we're all in the midst of planning, you know, and all sorts of things concerning the wedding. And so uh, weddings are on my mind. In uh, Jewish tradition, the bride and groom you know this? After the wedding service, they did not immediately go off for their honeymoon. No, as a matter of fact, um, they stayed there in the community for a full seven days. I don't even know if they ever went on honeymoons or not, but at least they began their marriage in the, you might say, the lap of the community that they were going to live in and that they came from, that they came from and that they were going to continue living in. Seven days, seven days of feasting were in order. And um, the bride and groom, during those seven days, didn't do any work. They didn't go to work, had, had a time off. They were not to even engage uh, themselves in any kind of shopping or business. Everything was provided for them. As a matter of fact, it was considered a great act of love or a, or a mitzvah, they call it. Mitzvah is the word for law, righteousness. A great commandment to, to make sure, if you possibly could, that the bride and groom rejoiced. This whole period, this whole time would, begin, it would be a time of rejoicing for them. In fact, the Jews, Jewish rabbis taught that it was considered as if the person who had uh, brought joy to the wedding uh, couple, the wedded couple, would be considered as if he had brought a sacrifice to the offering in, at the temple in Jerusalem or as if he had built some of the, rebuilt some of the ruins of Jerusalem. And with that in mind, with his wedding in mind, with the rejoicing in mind. Turn with me to Revelation 19, beginning with verse 7. Revelation chapter 19, beginning with verse 7. This is foundational for what we're going to be looking at today and the conclusions that we come to are connected with this passage of Scripture. We're going to be reading John 2. You might want to Go ahead and turn there uh, even now if you're already in Revelation 19. Are you there in Revelation 19? Everybody there, please say amen. Okay, here we go. Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the what? The marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Who is this speaking of? The church. Of fine linen as the righteousness of the saints. For it is the righteousness of the saints. And he said unto me, Write, blessed are they which are called to what? The marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true sayings of God. This is going to happen, in other words. This is true. Okay? So with this in mind, this foundational passage in mind, please now turn to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Mm -hmm. 
Can you imagine that? If you happen to have your uh, phone on, let's see. I'm going to turn mine uh, somehow, get it down here to where it's off. You might want to do the same thing. And that way you won't be embarrassed like I just embarrassed myself. <laughs> okay, now I've got to find John 2 again. I was there, lost it. Go find it again here. Okay. John chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. On the third day, what day was that, the third day? The third day of what? Third day of the week? On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they had ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? What does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. In verse 6, now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets forth, sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, in other words, when they've had, dr had drunk up all the good stuff, okay, when they had had their fill, you know, when they're not quite so thirsty anymore, then you bring out the inferior. That's what normally happens. But you have kept the good wine until now. I wonder, was he uh, chiding him? Was he rebuking him? Did he, was he telling me he did the wrong thing? Or was he impressed that the, first, that the best was last? Huh? He was impressed? What do you think? Well, we're going to, uh, we're not going to be concentrating on that in particular this morning, but you might be wanting to ask yourself that question and thinking about it. You know, everything that Jesus ever said and ever did, everything he ever said and ever did, I believe that there is a deeper meaning. And so as we read in Scripture of the things he said and the things he did, I suggest that you look, and then you look, and you look again. And keep looking, because it just may be that there's some spiritual lesson there or some insight that you will get as you compare Scripture with Scripture. Now, in this story... Mary comes to Jesus, and she says, Jesus, Jesus, they've run out of wine. And what did he say? He says, what does your concern have to do with me? Okay, my time is not yet. Now, I want to ask you something. Did Mary at that point give up? Did she surrender the, the matter to Jesus? Did she give up? Now, it was all men who said no. Ladies, what do you say? Did Mary at that point say, okay, it's up to you? Or did she say, um, okay, 
I'll drop it. Ladies, what do you say? What? She pursued. You got that. That's right. And, and how so? Well, in instructing the servants to do whatever he said, okay, is that really giving up? Or is it putting the ball into Jesus' court? Is it, in a sense, pressuring him to make a decision, either to help or not help? It was subtle, but that's what she was doing, wasn't it? She had not given up. Are you with me? <clears throat> now, why would she do that? This is the Son of God. <clears throat> this was the Son of God. She knew of his divinity. How dare she do that? <clears throat> you know, I think that she was certain, actually, that he would help. How many of you think she was certain he would help? How many, how many of you don't know? Okay. <clears throat> well, I, I am fairly certain that she was certain that he would help, that he would cave in to the desperation, the crisis of the moment, cave in to her request and find a solution. Now, why would she think that way? Number one, or maybe I shouldn't enumerate, in any case, just think of those servants. Think of Mary. Who came to Mary and told her that they were out of wine? I don't know, but somebody did, right? There was more than just Mary that knew what was going on. The servants certainly knew. They were, they were charged with, you know, providing when someone said, I need, uh, I'm thirsty, could you give me some more? The servants would be sent to get the more, and when they went, they started noticing, whoa, we're running out. What are we going to do? And finally, they ran out. They didn't have any more. And people were, now they're having to say, well, just, just a minute, we're, we're working on that. Until finally, someone alerts Mary, or maybe she's watching, and finally decides, look, I'm going to go ask Jesus for some help. Why would she do that, by the way? Why would she go to Jesus? <clears throat> you know, this was the first of his miracles, right? She had never seen him work a miracle before. It says right in the scripture, in this story, this, this was the beginning. You know, the, the word beginning is archi in the Greek. It's the same word that's used in John chapter 1 to say in the beginning, referring back to the creation of the world. In the beginning, the very start of the creation of human life. In the beginning. This was the beginning of his miracles. He'd never done one before. So she wasn't going to him because she thought he would work a miracle. Why would she go to him then? Because she had seen over time when people were in crisis, when people were in desperation, when people had genuine needs, that Jesus' heart went out to them and he often came up with a solution to people's problems. Either he counseled them, he provided his own food in some cases for people who were hungry, he would come up to a challenge and meet the challenge. He would often answer the need, the human need, the human desperation. <clears throat> you know, this idea of Jesus caving in, Jesus caving in, it's not a new issue, it's not a new question, did Jesus cave in to Mary? Does God cave in? Does Jesus cave in? I think God's favor is upon people who know that God, that God does cave in, quote unquote. Not in the full sense of, of the meaning of that phrase, but he does in a sense cave in to those who do not take his seeming uh, resistance or 
his silence as his final answer. Mary prevailed, I think, like, well, Jacob, who prevailed with God. As a matter of fact, he got the name change uh, to Israel because of this very thing. That's what the name means, doesn't it? Right? Israel, he who prevails with God. Like Abraham, who prevailed with God over Sodom. And like Moses, who prevailed with God for the salvation of Israel. And then there's the Canaanite woman. Would you turn to that story with me, please? Matthew 15. Here's a very good example of Jesus, you might say, caving in. This is a story of how he, he likes, I think, almost to set things up so, it, so that we learn that he caves in. Of course, there's other things at work here, other reasons why this story unfolds the way it does, but I think that's part of it. Matthew chapter 15, verse 22. Matthew chapter 15, verse 22. If you, please say amen if you're there. Okay, Matthew chapter 15, verse 22. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. 23. Jesus did not answer a word. He was silent. Not, he didn't answer her even one word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. In other words, they took his resistance to her. This is his first sign of resistance. Silence. He took that, they took that resistance as sort of agreeing with them that this woman was not worthy. She was a Canaanite. She was a Gentile. She wasn't a believer. You know? Salvation is for the Jews. God is for the Jews. The law is for the Jews. You know, even today, there, there are those Jews, Jewish rabbis, in fact, this is the most common thought on the Sabbath, they teach their people that the Sabbath is not for anyone other than Jews. Salvation is for the Jews. Send her away. <clears throat> and he answered. Now, they, now that they spoke up, he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Wow. Wow. So to this woman and to his disciples and everyone there, he announces, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Is that true? <clears throat> you know, it is definitely resisting her, isn't it? It's definitely resisting her appeal. Can you say amen? amen. But is it true? You know, in partiality it is. Do you remember when Jesus was talking to, to his disciples after he was resurrected and he was giving them instructions on what to do? What did he tell them to do? He says, first go to who? Huh? He said, go to the Jews first, then to the Samaritans. The Samaritans were people who had an exposure to to the living God, and then to the Gentiles. Jesus came the first time, you might say in a certain sense, primarily to try to win back his people, to save the lost sheep of Israel, to bring them back together into one fold, and to make of them a mighty evangelistic force for the world. You see it now? In a certain sense, he was sent to them primarily, at least we can say. Are you with me? Do you agree with that? Okay. Now, of course, that mission did not succeed. Unfortunately, they, the leaders resisted that. And only some came out of Israel to join him in that great evangelistic work. And that eventually did go to the Gentiles. So anyway, Jesus was not telling her something that wasn't true. That's what I'm really getting at. He didn't just say something that wasn't true. He was basically telling her the truth. All right. 
or let's put it this way, when he says only to the lost sheep, right now I'm only here to try to win them back so that they can then reach out further. Okay. Not that all human beings are excluded from salvation. Well, anyway, if you can see that point, let's move on to verse 25 now. The woman came and knelt before him, and here's what she said, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Do you know what she did? Do you know what crossed her mind? At first, Jesus didn't even answer her. Okay? But now he was at least speaking to her, and she saw that as a door. Just opening a little bit. And you know what she did? Lord, help me. She stuck her foot right in the door. She saw hope there. She saw a, a chance that maybe he was going to listen to her appeal, that he was going to help her and her daughter. Verse 26. So she says, Lord, help me. And he says, and he replies, verse 26, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Three times he resisted her. Silence. He says, look, I'm here primarily for Israel, not for you. I'm here really to get things going with Israel, not with the Canaanites. I'm not evangelizing Canaanites. I'm evangelizing the Jews. So he silence. I'm here to evangelize the Jews, not the Gentiles. And three, whoa, he says, we don't give the food to the dogs. Man, can you imagine? What an insult. You're a dog. Did I tell you about the time that, uh, it's the last time, First time and last time I ever tried to do any matchmaking. You know, took my little Cupid arrow and Mike, Mike from out in Needles came out because I, I knew this, uh, baptized this young lady that uh, was work. she was from Mexico and just really a nice young lady and I thought, hmm, you know, I just, for some reason, I knew Mike was alone and, you know, he wanted to be married and et cetera. And so I set this thing up. And they got, we went for a, a, a walk up and uh, off of Fuller Ridge Trailhead. I wish, that you, I wish all of you could go to Fuller Ridge Trailhead and take that walk with us sometime. It's just a beautiful place, but it's too far away, 100 miles from here, whatever it is. And uh, anyway, after the walk was over, we came back to the parking lot. By the way, it's about 8,000 feet up in the mountains, just Gorgeous place, looking down over the valley. Um, so we're going back into the parking lot, and this young lady was talking about some fellow at work that was just wouldn't leave her alone, you know, constantly calling her. She was resisting him. She didn't want his attentions and so forth. And Mike, you know, there are two different cultures here. So Mike says, oh, he's just like a little puppy dog. And that got translated, and she got mad at Mike. Because apparently, at least in some Hispanic uh, circles, when you refer to a person as a dog or a perro or whatever, you know, it's a great insult. And so she thought he was a rather uncouth person and so forth, and that just blew up, and she never wanted to have anything to do with him anymore. And then so I went home, and I carefully put my bow and arrow up on the... <laughs> Never to be seen again. <laughs> anyway, so he, he, he is, she's, he's calling her a dog. You see that? That's a tremendous insult. And what does she do? She says, aha. If the thought came to her mind, she had an answer to that. And she saw the door open just still a little bit more. Now, you, you, might, you and I might have said, oh, it just, that door just closed. But no, she saw it as still open. As a matter of fact, when, she, when the answer came to her, what to reply, 
and I believe the Holy Spirit inspired it, she, she saw the door starting to open a little bit more. Because what did she say? Let's read it together. Let's read it. Follow me as I read it, okay? Yes, Lord, she says. Jesus says, we don't give food to the dogs. But she came back with this. Yes, you're right, Lord. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. She loved her daughter so much, she didn't care about you know, any, any implied insult or whatever. She just saw someone that she knew could help, and she pressed her appeal forward and said, look, Lord, just give me a crumb. Just give us a crumb. Do you realize what this is saying, what she's saying here? Well, let's look at the rest. Let's look at the next thing that Jesus replies. He just says, then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Now, why would he say that? Well, this woman has just equated her request with just the crumbs of what Jesus had pr uh, proposed to bring to Israel. Let me say that again. Jesus has a whole meal laid out for Israel. He is planning a, a fantastic feast for Israel. And she's saying, Lord, all I want is just the crumbs. So the, he, the casting out of the demon, the healing of her daughter who is demon-possessed, okay, is, is she saying, that's just a little crumb, Lord. Some of us would say, Wow, that's a big deal if we saw it happen. But she is right. That is just a tiny little matter concerning or off the table of the great feast, the great blessings that Jesus wants to bring to his people. He says, you have great faith. Faith, I believe, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so... Let's look at it again, 28. Matthew 15, 28. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. Jesus caved in to the desperate woman, and it goes on to say, Her daughter was healed from that very hour. Praise God. Jesus caved in. Now, we must be careful, by the way, at this point. You know, before I come to the real point here, we must be careful not to think, to assume that all we ask for, if we just keep pressing our petitions, that everything we ask for is going to be granted. Or that anything is going to be granted to us. But it certainly encourages us that when we are praying according to what we know about the character of God, that he will come through in his time, in his way, that he will at times cave in to our requests. Have you seen it in your life? How many can say, I've prayed and God has answered my prayers? Raise those hands high. The rest of you, look around. Everybody, look around. Look at, look at your hands. You're testifying to each other, one to the other right now, of the goodness of your God in answering your prayers. Amen. Thank you. Now, I want to say something about Mary. We have to keep in mind the Catholic doctrinal influence as we look at this. You know, the Roman Catholicism sees Mary as this great media... How do you say that? Mediatrix. Say it, please, again. Mediatrix. Mediatrix, okay. Co-mediator, a right? mediator between God and man. When she intervenes, you know... God caves in and gives her what she wants, you know. But we see here in Abraham, in Moses, in Jacob, in the Canaanite woman, that God answers the prayers. He caves in not only to Mary. She doesn't have anything special above or beyond what we have with God and our relationship with him. We have the same. The only thing that she did have that we do not have is that she had 30 years of him living right there at home with her. 
But you know what? Even though she knew him so well, okay, we also can know him well through his word. All right, I want to just, this was only going to take a few moments and then we're done. My hour or my time is not yet come. What did he mean by that? You know, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Do you want to understand that a little bit better? Are you ready? Here we go. <clears throat> Remember this passage, Revelation 19, beginning with verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready, and to her is granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are true sayings of God. Brothers and sisters, there's the answer. Do you see it yet? Well, let me tell you about it. Okay. My time is not yet come. To whom did it devolve upon to provide for the feasts? Going back to the very place we started. Seven days of feasting. Who provided the food? I know some of you know the answer. Please say it loud. Don't be shy. Who provided it? You don't know? The groom and his family. They were the one charged with providing for the seven days of feasting. The servants were so embarrassed. Well, actually, they were trying to protect the reputation of the groom and his family and try to keep the, the stain of, or, or, or disdain, the, the bad memories of a, of a failed uh, wedding reception, you might say, of seven days long um, re wedding reception, trying to protect their uh, reputation by keeping it secret and then going you know, to Jesus. Mary was whispering those words, hey, they've run out of wine, because she didn't want everybody to know about it. It would be embarrassing. It was, in any case, it was the groom's family that was supposed to provide for that meal. Hmm, Jesus is saying, my time is not yet come. What, is this, what does this have to do with me? Who was supposed to provide for the meal? The groom and his family. Is Jesus a groom? Yes, he is. So when he said, what does this have to do with me? He's saying, this isn't my wedding. My time, my wedding is in the future, way off in the future. I'm going to have a wedding. My people are going to be in the new Jerusalem. There's going to be a table there. It's going to take a miracle to provide for this wedding today. If I'm, going to, if, if, we're, if I'm going to solve this problem, I'm going to have to exercise miraculous power. How do, you, how do you think that the, how do you imagine, I should say, that the food will appear upon the table set before us at the wedding supper of the Lamb? Could it be that it will be like those loaves and fishers that just seem to appear, you know, in the baskets? You know, they pull one out and there's another one there that just couldn't seem to you know, get to the bottom of the basket, you know, the fish and the loaves. Miraculous, right? It was miraculous. Somehow I don't, th I just can't see the angels going out or us going out, eat, for that matter, you know, and picking the fruit off the trees and going into the kitchen and baking the bread and, and uh, you know, uh, another group of us or the angels, you know, gathering the grapes, you know, and throwing them into a big vat, you know, and, and then stomping them down, you know, making, making grape juice. No! In my imagination, anyway, and tell you the truth, I think I'm right. Jesus is going to say, sit down, everybody. It's time to eat. It's time to feast. This is my wedding banquet. 
And I am going to provide for everyone here. And he speaks and boom, there's the bread. All baked. The best bread you've ever had. And he speaks and, the, and there's the fruits. Right in front of us. Just boom, there it is. Actually, I kind of see it as kind of like a wave right down the table, you know, unfolding, not just suddenly appearing. And then the same with these beautiful goblets. He speaks, and there they all are. And he says, put a little wine in those, and boom, right down the line. The, the wine is just, whoa, look at that. And then there's the blessing, and he gives thanks. We bow our heads. Then we begin to feast together, share together, witness together the wonders of God, and tell our story about how I got there, how you got there, what he brought us through, how good he is, praising him, bringing gladness and joy to one another through our witness of his greatness. Ah, that's the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he's inviting you to go there, to witness all this. You'll, then you'll find out whether I'm right or not. You will find out I'm right, but no, I mean, anyway, just kidding. Do you want to be there? Do you want to see that? Then, brothers and sisters, put all your faith in him. Put all your faith in him. And live according to his commands. You do those two things. You live according to his commands. You know, the, 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 I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to stop right here. You order your life according to the love that he teaches in his law. Love for one another. Compassion. Forgive one another. Live in harmony with one another and with all men. And put all your faith in him and you'll be there. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for laying out before us the faith of Jesus, the wonder of Jesus, the glory of Jesus. And oh, Father, help us this day and this coming week, all week long. Oh, Lord, help us, please. We really need your help to order our lives according to your will, for his sake. Amen. Good job. <laughs>